Uh, thanks for uh, showing up again. It's a good sign to see you back in this room. Uh, so maybe a small recap of what did we do so far. Uh, we learned a bit about these structural causal models, and the idea was that they always induce an observational distribution and then also some interventional distributions that were denoted, denoted by these do interventions. So what was a structural causal model? If you write down an example, so you may have um, three random variables that you're interested in, and you're saying x, for example, is a function of y plus some noise, and then you may have y is a function of z plus some noise, and maybe z is just noise. So then you, there was a corresponding graph. So this we always draw by uh, looking at the variables that appear on the right-hand side. So here, y is causing x, and oops. Z is causing Y, so this is the corresponding graph. Um, what we were also looking at are these uh, questions of uh, adjusting. So we were discussing a bit that in uh, linear Gaussian models, for example, you are interested um, often in sort of summarizing the causal effect from, let's say, Z to X. And this was done by, in the linear case, by just multiplying the path coefficients. And what was the adjusting? So again, in when you talk about causality, it's very important to sort of keep in mind what the problem is. In adjusting, the goal was if we are given the causal structure, let's say the graph, and the distribution, then the uh, sort of the theory of adjusting tells you how to compute the causal effects. How to compute causal effects. It will, for example, summarize by these uh, just multiplying the path coefficients. So this is always important to have in mind, right? So wh what are we actually solving here? So what is given and what, uh, what are we trying to infer? So there we talked a bit about uh, adjustment. And again, so, he, so far we have always assumed that we are given sort of the, the causal structure. And we will try to relax this in the second part uh, of this, this tutorial. OK, so this was the uh, place where I left you at. Uh, it's the visual break. Something that you may want to do is even in like nonlinear settings, you want to be able to say, well, what is actually a causal effect? So when is a random variable causing another random variable? And there I'm uh, asking for suggestions. So now we have to make a definition. Um, so in fact, it turns out that there are a couple of definitions that are all equivalent. But now the goal is to say, well, do we have a sensible way of saying when is a random variable x causing another random variable? Um, so given that we are, is, have a structural causal model, we want to define that there is a total causal effect. So these are the questions that uh, we need, and then we are almost done <coughs> sort of uh, with the theoretical side there with the structural causal models. So do you have suggestions? How would you define this? Yeah? Can you say again? We can draw a path between the two variables. OK, very good. So let's say when there is a path between x and y, a directed path. So now, of course, I want to challenge you. Let's say we have a situation like this. So this is a very valid uh, definition that you can do. But if you have a situation like this, so again, a linear model, and these are the path coefficients, uh, then, of course, I'm playing the adversarial here, then you might be wondering whether this is the best definition. Because if you look at this, this situation, what happens now is that if you intervene on this guy, so if you put this to a very large value, what you have is now, and of course I've drawn this on, on purpose, you have that sort of these two paths between x and y, they cancel each other out exactly. And this is uh, the adversarial y, because this means that if you intervene on this guy, if you set it very large, you will not see any response in y because the effect cancel each other out um, via these two different paths. And this is why uh, it's a valid thing to do, but why uh, in many cases you look at, uh, at, a, at a different definition. This is a very good idea, but this is, again, something maybe that you won't, don't want to have. Because here, if you change x, you don't see an effect in y. Yeah? I have a question about this. So, yeah. so, so this never happened. That's a very good question. So I mean, is there a notion of sort of generic situation? Where yes. You know, and it has a name. It's called faithfulness. So why is this? We will see this later. And uh, we should have a small discussion about how strong this assumption is. It's a very interesting uh, point. So 
in a way, you're right. So you're saying, well, this never happens to make this um, sort of rigorous. You can say if you put a density on the edge coefficients, then this situation where these two paths cancel each other out, this happens with a probability of zero. In fact, sometimes in nature, these, do things, uh, these things do happen. And why is this the case? Uh, so there's one famous example. Uh, I don't uh, recover probably the, all the details. But you have uh, the sunlight is causing the vitamin D production, right? So then you would think that if you go to like countries that are close to the equator, for example, that they are maybe they produce more vitamin D. The point is, however, that evolution arranged it such that uh, these two things become independent. So this is, goes via the mechanism of the uh, color of your skin, right? So sometimes in biological systems, you can actually argue that you do want to have these canceling uh, uh, out of paths. But if from a mathematical point of view, you're correct, these things do not, uh, do not happen, yeah. Any other suggestions about this? I mean, basically, how, yeah. much, how much y changes when we change x? Yeah, OK, this you could do. So this goes in the direction of what we have done before, right? So here, we only want to um, like define the existence of a total causal effect. And I'm just showing you some of the uh, possibilities. This will be very technical. But hopefully, it's not so surprising if you look at it. So one way to say is, well, if you randomize x, so you set x to a certain noise distribution that has a full support, then you actually find that x and y are dependent on each other. This is something that we are uh, known from randomized studies. So this is what we are adopting in the medical sector. So we are saying, well, whenever you randomize uh, the treatment, so for example, think about a drug, and you randomize how much of the drug uh, the patient gets, and you see that the amount of the drug that the person gets um, has an influence or depends then on the outcome, then it must be a causal, causal effect, right? So this is a very natural um, uh, sort of definition if you think about these randomized, uh, randomized trials. So you randomize x, and then you see that x and y depend on each other. The point is that there are many other, this doesn't, isn't important for the remainder of the talk, just to remind you, so there are many other equivalent notions you can prove this. So for example, you can also say that there are actually two values that you can set x to, let's say 3 and 7, su such that the distribution of y changes, um, and so on. But this is, I mean, this is how you can go on and saying, OK, this is a causal effect. And I just show this because I would like you to sort of uh, at least intuitively agree with the first <laughs> statement, because this is what we discussed last time. Yeah? The meaning of x in a, that sim is simply the statistical independence, the symbol. Yeah, uh, the good question. So this means. Uh, when it's not crossed out, it means that these two things are statistically independent. When it's crossed out, it means they are statistically dependent. Yeah, Because then this is something that is in this new distribution, right? But this is just a statistical notion. Yeah. How does all this differ than simply saying, if you change x, you change y? It doesn't differ at all. Okay. It makes it formal. <laughs> this is what we are, we are trying to do. Like uh, We have been developing this structural causal model, and so far, we cannot do anything new, but we can do it in a formal way. So this is exactly what you're saying. So you're saying when you change x, then you see a change in y. So the distribution of y changes. This is exactly what we are doing here. Yeah. Good. So then the question is, how do you find causal strength? So this is only the existence. So how do you, now you want to say maybe, well, now I want to say that x has a very strong influence on y, or maybe a not so strong influence on y. How to do that? That is much more difficult. Uh, so if you have a good idea, you can easily write a paper about this. Uh, in the linear setting, this, there are a couple of reasons why this uh, sort of uh, notion that I showed you, the derivative of the expectation under the do notation, why this is something quite canonical, whereas in the nonlinear setting, it's not. So if you have a good idea how to define a causal strength between two random variables, uh, then please let me know. So there was actually some work in the 70s on the Direct information, essentially, if you look at it, essentially, the information between x and y, when x, x essentially influences y, yeah. will that give you some notion of This is an idea that has a couple of drawbacks. We are, I'm happy to de de discuss this afterwards. I don't want to go into too much details here. There are a couple of ideas, and they all have their pro and pros and cons, but this is not that there's a, there's a final answer or anything. OK? So this is a rather technical definition. Any questions about this? Probably not. So why exactly is the, the derivative not? 
in because our, even in, in a nonlinear set, in primary, we're talking about a local perturbation. Yeah, you can do that. It's not a number anymore, right? So then you get a function. So in the linear setting, I was a bit quick on this but, uh, for the purpose, I think. So if you look at the expectation, this was the definition that we had, right? So we were setting x to some value small x. We were looking at the expectation of y. And we see how much does this change if we change x. The point is, in linear settings, what is, if, assume that the, you have a joint Gaussian distribution. What is the expectation uh, of y if we condition on x and the set we have, the adjustment set, then all this becomes linear. So then if we take this, this is a linear function in x, so if we take the derivative, this is just a number. This is some real number. But of course, in general, this will depend on x. You can still do this, and this would be one direction to go to, yeah. OK, so these are a couple of like, uh, open questions. There's something else that I would like to tell you about, and this is the instrumental variable setting. This is something that uh, you see in practice a lot, uh, especially in economics. And econometricians use this many times. And what is the idea here? So I told you that if you want to compute something like a causal effect, so in linear setting, let's say we want to compute this guy here. Then I told you that if you have hidden variables, it's a bit difficult. So you have to use this adjusting. So let's say you have x and you have y, and we're interested in the causal effect from x to y. But there is a hidden variable that we do not observe that influences um, x and y at the same time. The problem is, if we want to compute the causal effect, we have to adjust for h. But if we do not know h, then sort of we cannot do anything, right? This was the argument that I told you prevents us from computing the causal effect in the smoking example. But now there is uh, some help. And this is the instrumental variable that you can exploit. So what is this? An instrumental variable is a variable that is causally uh, sort of an ancestor of x. And this is now a trick that only works in linear systems, but <laughs> that is rather neat, I think. So we are interested in, let's say, this coefficient here, this alpha. But again, we cannot just regress y on x because this h messes up things. So what is the situation here? So um, if you think about smoking and lung cancer, <coughs> what you now want to have is you want to have a variable that is causally influencing the fact whether you smoke or not, but that does not have an effect of, for example, the hidden variables. So for example, on your genetic status, or on your socioeconomic status, or like on your stress factor or whatsoever. And you also want that this instrumental variable is not causing y directly. So what could you use in this situation? So um, in the smoking and lung cancer example, people have looked at the tax on tobacco. Because if you have a lot of tax on tobacco, what happens is that probably people start smoking less, but the tax doesn't really affect whether you get lung cancer or not directly, right? It only affects it via this variable, uh, whether you smoke or not. And also, hopefully, the text doesn't change your genetic uh, factors. OK? So this is a situation you can think of. And now, why does it work? So let's give all these equations a name. So let me see. So you may have to help me now, because it's always harder to see if you're on the front. So y equals alpha times x plus gamma times h plus some noise. Which I'm just writing out the structural equation here for y. I'm doing the same thing with x. So x equals beta times h plus delta times i plus, let's call it nx. And now what you can do, if you plug this in, then you get y equals alpha times beta plus gamma times h. I'm just plugging this in. Plus alpha times delta i plus alpha times nx plus ny. Is this correct? It shouldn't be any magic. I'm just plugging in these formula into each other. We get alpha times beta plus gamma times h. No? Then we get alpha delta times i, alpha nx, and ny. I think it's correct. So now what you do, this is a, a method called two stages least square. And it's as simple as you can imagine. So these are two stages of least squares. And the first one is you regress x on i. If you do this, 
then there's nothing in between, right? There's no, I mean, there's no problem. So what you get is exactly delta out, at least in the population sense. So you get an unbiased estimator for delta. Now what you do next is you're looking at the fitted values. So you get an unbiased estimator for delta, and now we are looking at the fitted values, which are roughly equal to delta times i. Okay, so the first step, first step is regress x on i, and the second second step is first find fitted values. And those will be roughly delta times i, right? Because here you get an unbiased estimator of delta. If you look at the fitted values of i, you get delta i. And then what do you do next? You see it? What's the second step? So in the second step, we have now delta i. And what we are doing in the second step, we just regress y on our fitted values delta times i. So here, regress y on fitted values. So what does it mean? We have the delta i from the first step. And now we have this equation here. And if you regress y on delta times i, what do you get? So this is our fitted values, right? So if we regress y on delta times i, we roughly get alpha. And why is this? Because all the other terms here that appear in the structural equation are independent of i. So that is super important. You look uh, not convinced yet. OK, two-step procedure. First, we regress x on i. This is, there's no problem with this regression. We get a delta. Second step, we do a regression from y on the fitted values. So we regress this guy on delta times i, and what you get out is alpha. Is this clear? <laughs> so what is nice about this? It shows you that in some settings, you get identifiability of causal effects where you would have thought at the beginning, well, this is not possible to get it, right? Because there's a confounding factor that you never observe. So it doesn't matter what this is. You're only, what, the only thing that you're assuming it is that it enters via a linear equation. And this, of course, is a very strong assumption. This is the method called instrumental variables, like in a nutshell. And this has been used in economics for like many, many, many times. Because, and you can imagine how this paper reads. So it's always the same story. So what they say is we are interested in a causal effect that is possibly confounded. And then they are suggesting to say, aha, but we could use this random variable, let's call this text, as an instrument. And then sort of now goes like two pages. You can imagine what happens. For two pages, the authors try to argue why this is a valid argument, uh, why this is a valid instrument. Because now you have to argue with background knowledge that the instrument is causing x, but not causing y directly. Right? So in the text, in the text example, I think this is uh, most of us would agree, I hope. So there you would say, well, the text probably has an influence on the on this fact whether you smoke, but it doesn't have an influence like via other paths. But this is, in many situations, it's not so clear. And then you have to, to uh, argue about it. Yeah, any questions about this? This is like an equivalent to basically uh, a randomized test. Like you're, you're doing an intervention, uh, how do you call it, on, on, on x, right? Uh, your, your i can be the, the researcher that assigns uh, values to, to x. So you have a way of controlling. If you can argue that you're only controlling x, that's like Yes, so the, the point is that this, is, this goes into the direction of a randomized uh, study, right? But it's, it's indeed the case. But it's randomized in a bit of a funny way because, because we keep this uh, factor, this influence intact. So we are really only randomizing, if you like, a part of it. But we are putting some noise into the system, and then we see how it reacts. Um, this is something that we will maybe see later tomorrow or at the talk on Friday. But this is, in, in fact, a nice intuition. However, it becomes much more complicated if these functions are nonlinear, because then you cannot do this nice trick anymore. Because the, what you need here, maybe you see this directly, what you need is uh, if you plug it through this function, if this would be a nonlinear function, then you cannot nicely separate sort of these i terms and the h terms. They all get messed up. 
and then you cannot do this trick anymore. Yeah? That is my question. But I actually have a comment. As a tab tobacco industry consultant, I would say that the tax makes me stressful, <laughs> and therefore I get cancelled. Ah, you're very <laughs> good. The, you're high up in the bonus list. <laughs> I like that. socioeconomic, the economic. If you're taking 5,000 cigarettes, it's going to change your economic status. Also a good point, yeah. But this is, I mean, these are exactly the points that you would find in, in discussing in a, in a discussion part of the paper, right? Because in a way, this thing you cannot test for, at least in most generalities. So this is what you have to argue. This is why these papers in economics, they always try to argue, no, we don't believe that there's an error. Yeah. Does this require like full support or anything on, on, on H? Or any kind of distribution? Uh, no. So the distribution of H, I think it doesn't matter too much. You c but there's, this uh, method is sensitive with respect to one factor that you, sorry, that you may, may have noticed already. Um, and this is this delta. So if the delta is very small, this is what people call a weak instrument. This is problematic. Why? Because then you get a very large variance if you want to estimate this guy. So the fitted value will get a very large variance. So this estimator is messed up. So you might be unbiased, but uh, the variance is sort of uh, destroying everything. So this is why you can try to test for this. I mean, you can see how strong is this. But they are also, in these papers, they also always argue why this is a strong influence. Yeah? It may be expensive, but why not just have two independent eyes where you can be logical about how they may be independent of each other, I one and I two. And if you get the same alpha with two different eyes. Ah, this is a brilliant idea. This is what people do. Uh, so this is a, I mean, this is in a way, sometimes this goes into the direction what people sometimes call do double robustness. So what you, the suggestion is as follows. You have one instrument, and then you take a second one, and then you see whether you get the same alpha or not. And if you don't get the same alpha, then you know that you're in trouble. Why are people um, not always doing this? I mean, it's expensive, and there's another reason for this. I mean, I didn't plan to, to talk about this, but if this is high dimensional, so if x has sort of not, is not a real value, but it has five components, then in order for this identification to work, you need five instrumental variables as well. So if this is, so sort of if this is in R to the five, this is five dimensional, for the identifiability to work, this also has to be five dimensional. And this is why, I mean, if you are lucky, you have, I mean, it's pretty hard to find instruments anyhow. So, but if you are lucky enough to have a lot of them, then there's a lot of research on this. Like many weak instruments, then you can try to sort of use them as a, as a sanity check. Yeah. I mean, this is, why, why am I saying this? Because these instrumental variables, they somehow tell you that this identification that you get is not always it's sort of related to this adjustment, it's sometimes also coming from the fact that you have sort of small model classes. And this is what we are going to see in courses structure learning as well. So in some situations, it really helps if your functions that appear in the structural equations or structural causal uh, assignments, if they are simple. And this is an example for identification where the, uh, that hopefully supports this. So here are simple functions, in this case linear functions, they help for identification. Any questions about instruments? Good. So then I would like to talk a bit about counterfactuals. And let me see whether this works now. I brought a small movie that you may have seen before. Do you think the sound is working? All right. Now we're ah, ready perfect. For my next question. In a world where rhinoceroses are domesticated pets, who wins the Second World War? <laughs> Uganda. Defend. Kenya rises to power on the export of rhinoceroses. A Central African power bloc is formed, colonizing North Africa and Europe. When war breaks out, no one can afford the luxury of a rhino. Kenya withers, Uganda triumphs. <laughs> Correct, my turn. <laughs> In a world where a piano is a weapon, not a musical instrument, on what does Scott Joplin play the maple leaf rag? Tuned bayonets. Defend. Isn't it obvious? You're right, my apologies. <laughs> what the hell are you guys playing? It's a game we invented. It's called counterfactuals. 
We postulate an alternate world that differs from ours in one key aspect, and then pose questions to each other. It's fun for ages 8 to 80. Join us. <laughs> All right, I like a good brain teaser. Give it a whirl. You're in luck. This is an easy one. In a world where mankind is ruled by a giant intelligent beaver, what food is no longer consumed? Uh, a BLT where the B stands for beaver? I don't know. <laughs> Leonard, be serious. We're playing a game here. <clears throat> I can figure this out. Let's see. Um, well, beavers eat tree bark. The only tree bark I know that humans consume is cinnamon, so I'll say cinnamon. Incorrect. Obviously, the answer is cheese Danish. <laughs> what? In a world ruled by a giant beaver, mankind builds many dams to please the beaver overlord. The low-lying city of Copenhagen is flooded, thousands die, devastated, the Danes never invent their namesake pastry. <laughs> How does one miss that? This is ridiculous. You're just making stuff up. Is he always like this when he loses? Oh, yes. You should have been here for the great Jenga tantrum of 2008. <laughs> OK, so this is about counterfactuals. Um, there's actually a fun thing about this video that I didn't know before, this uh, Danish pastry. I think that's what you call it. In Denmark, it's not called Danish pastry, of course. It's called uh, bread from Vienna. So yeah. <laughs> Vienna bread, but anyhow. So this is something, I mean, uh, I first would like to make a couple of these things formal and then we can, can discuss a bit about this movie. So what are these counterfactuals? So this is the game that they are playing. And now we have the tools to make this, uh, this rigorous. And again, I think it's nice to have seen it once. Um, and then we can discuss a bit about the interpretation of these. OK. so. Formally, we, we start with the structural causal model, right? And what was this formally again? So we had these uh, different structural assignments, and then we had a joint noise distribution. So let's say this is a pair. So we have the structural assignments. So let's say these three equations. And then we have a noise distribution. So let's say a joint distribution over the noise variables. Now, the definition of a counterfactual is quite easy. So what we are saying is that we have observed something. And the game that they are playing, they always say, OK, we are living in a world right now, so there's some observation uh, that, that we make. And how you define it in a sort of math world is as follows. So um, counterfactual structural causal model is obtained from a given given observation, so you observe some value of x, where you observe that the random variables x take some value, let's say 3, 17, whatever, um, by conditioning the noise distribution. Okay, so what you're doing is you're just replacing this guy by the conditional where you update all the noise variables. So you're saying, not, now I'm not using the old noise variables anymore, but I'm conditioning on the observation that I have. So this is what, what they are doing. So they are saying, OK, we observe the world as, world as it is right now, but then they make these counterfactual statements. So what would have happened if, uh, I don't know what the example was, so if the world is ruled by a giant beaver? So then what happens is that these counterfactual statements are just do statements in this new structural causal model. So counterfactuals they correspond to do statements. It's the same thing in the new structural causal model. OK, this is very formal, so it, maybe it's good to make an example. Because you, now what you do is you intervene on only some of the variables. So you want to say that you keep like, these variables fixed. Let's, let's say, um, so the example that I will do now uh, goes as follows. So for example, you have a patient, so you have some uh, treatment, and this treatment has a success with a pro certain probability. And then you observe some patient. 
And for this patient, you observe that he, may, for example, got the treatment and it didn't help. And then you are asking questions like, what would have happened if this person had gotten the treatment? So this is what we are going to write down. So what this means is that we like, condition on everything that we observed, but then we are only changing parts of it. This is what, what they did as well. No? They are saying, OK, we observe the world as it is right now, and now we are only changing one bit. So we are only saying everything keeps exactly the same as it is. All the rules remain the same, except for the world is like uh, ruled by a giant beaver. So they only change one bit. This is why you want to sort of condition on everything here. So let's do an example. So you have a treatment. So you either get treated, uh, treated or not. So this is NT. And then you have a recovery. And this recovery, so this is a bit special. So what happens is, depends on some noise. So just write down the formula. OK, so what's written here? So you get some treatment, and then depending on the treatment, you either recover or not. This is a very simplistic model, but I just want to explain counterfactuals here. So how does it work? The, uh, this noise variable is just a Bernoulli variable with 99%, so in most of the cases, it's 1. So imagine that one, for one person, this, is, uh, this noise variable here is 1. So you really now, a patient is sort of classified, or the properties of the patients are really in these noise variables here, nt and nr. So let's say for a given person, this random variable here is 1. What does it mean? So this part vanishes then. So the recovery is just treatment times 1. So it's just if the person gets the treatment, he recovers. And if he doesn't, he doesn't recover. Right? So it seems like a very effective treatment. So for most of the people, it's like a good thing to do. So now we observe Tom. So Tom goes into the, uh, into the, like, to visit this medical doctor. And for Tom, we have that nt equals 1 and nr equals 0. OK, so what does this mean? You can, OK, we, we can actually start from here. It's fine. So you observe that the treatment is 1. So he got treatment, but he didn't recover. OK? So actually, it got worse. I'd say it got worse. So this actually, so if this is the observation, this implies, of course, that the NT must have been 1. And because the, he got the treatment, but he didn't recover, this means the NR was 0. OK? So you observe something about Tom. This is what you observe about Tom. And then you can infer something about the noise. So now what are we going to do? We are going to update our structural causal model for Tom. So we know that Tom must, because we know the observations for Tom, we know this must have been the properties of Tom. So this is why Tom gets a new uh, structural causal model. And how does this look like? Well, t equals 0, right? Uh, t equals 1. And what is this? So this nr is 0, so this part vanishes. So the recovery is just 1 minus t. This is the new structural causal model. Does this make sense? So what I've done now is I formally conditioned the, the sort of I've updated the structural causal model by replacing only the noise variables, right? So I've written down exactly the same structural causal uh, the stru the same structural assignments, but now I've updated the noise variables because for Tom I know because of the observations this nt equals one and r and r equals zero. Does this make sense? There's, again, no magic. So now we can do a do statement in this new structural causal model. And how does it go? What would have happened if Tom would have, received the treat, uh, would have not received the treatment? This we can now write down. So I write down here the mass formula. So what you're doing is you're conditioning. You start with the structural causal model, call it C. You're conditioning on the observation. So this was t equals 1 and r equals 0. So 
So this means we are now in a counterfactual world. And now what we are doing is we are setting the treatment to zero. And then the recovery is one. So this is a very complicated way of writing the following sentence. Tom would have recovered had he received no treatment. Are you following? So what are we doing? We start with the structural causal model that is given. We observe one patient. So we observe this guy. This lets us infer something about the noise variable. So now what we are doing is we are updating, this, updating the structural causal model. This is now a personal structural causal model for this guy, for this one patient. And then we are doing inference in this, for this one patient. And we are, doing, we are saying, for example, now we can say, well, for Tom, we know that he would have recovered had he received no treatment. And this is how you write it. This is indicating that you are in the new structural causal model, in this personal one. And this indicates an intervention. This is as complicated <laughs> as it gets. And this is the statement then. So the recovery would have been one. And now the question is, of course, shall the doctor pay? Because now Tom can say, uh, Tom goes to, like, uh, goes to the judge and says, oh, look at this. The doctor did exactly the wrong, uh, wrong thing to me. He should have given like no treatment. But in fact, he treated me. And this is why I didn't recover. But I would have recovered if he had done the, the different thing. Yeah? A related question. So if instead of using uh, coin and R, you use two independent coins, NR and NR prime, that have the same biases. So in terms of the experiments that we do in my mind, it's the same thing. But in terms of the counterfactual, it's completely different. Yes, so the, the point is that, and this is what you can uh, sort of criticize this, uh, this for. This now really depends on the form of the structural causal model. And this relates to the video. Why? Because. Um, Leonard at some point says, this is all rubbish. You're just making things up. And there's a truth to it. Because what, what, what he means, I think, is to say, well, you're really relying on the structural causal model. So is there any way you can actually get data in order to validate this or not? Because I can write down a very similar structure, and this is what you're suggesting, I think, that, is, that entails exactly the same observational distribution and, in fact, the same interventional distributions, but that like, lead to other counterfactual statements. And this is a bit worrying, right? Because then you're wondering, well, how on earth do you ever test for these statements? And this, I think, is a very valid point. And this is, it turns out that in some situations, you can actually do something. But this is, a, a, this is a, a, a field of research. So in many situations, you cannot. So in many situations, you just have to believe the structural causal model. And then I would say it's a bit of a funny thing to do, to write something down that you can never actually falsify. So this is why I think it's good that people are working on this. But for example, why I personally would say I'm not spending too much of my limited time into this. Because it's really the question, like, what do we do with this, right? How do we, how do we uh, sort of validate this? But so having said this, um, a couple of comments maybe. Because the sort of the, the first one is, it's again this falsifiability that is important. So it seems that these statements are not falsifiable. But then the other point is that they play a super important role. So if you think about uh, like the um, like judges, for example, it's often that they come up to statements similar like this. No, so you're saying, well, what would have happened if you had not done this? Maybe you would have saved a life. So then at some point, we are, it's actually important to think about these, these cases. So shall these counterfactual statements play a role in court or not? Another thing is that for some reason, and I was thinking about this for a bit, um, I'm curious to hear your opinion. They play it like psychologically. They, are super, they play a major role in our life. So it's often that we think, so maybe we did exactly the correct decision. And this is the, this example four, right? So the doctor, in a way, did a very sensible thing. Because he, he applied the treatment, and for 99% of the people, it's exactly the right thing to do. If you have a patient and you don't know whether NT equals NR equals 1 or 0, then it's exactly the correct thing to do. And he did the correct thing. But then afterwards, he said, then he, he, you can say, well, for this guy, it was sort of the wrong thing. But you only know this, 
like afterwards. So this, I think, also sometimes happens in life, no? So that you're doing something and you have the impression maybe you did at that point exactly the correct decision, but then you're sort of thinking, ah, I should have done it differently. And it's a bit of a weird thing why we think about this. And so what psychologists say is that what happens is that um, you are attaching emotions to certain decisions. And this helps you to not forget. So if you, for example, in this learning process, if you put a lot of sort of emotional things to these, uh, to these decisions that you take, then maybe you remember that it's very careful <laughs> to decide in these situations. So I'm, a, as I said before, I'm a <laughs> big fan of soccer. And there was this uh, goal in 1966, it's called the Wembley goal, where Germany was in the final and they lost against England. And there was like uh, in the uh, very late of the game, there was this three to two. And there was a line judge, Bachanov, he was Soviet. And what we think, what all Germans think, ah, if he would have just not been Soviet. Because what happened is it was a Swiss uh, referee. And they didn't have a common language to communicate. So they, 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 this line judge only like, spoke uh, Russian and some other Eastern European language. And the Swiss guy, they, they couldn't communicate. So they had to communicate by sort of hand signs. And then the referee said, oh, OK, it was a goal. And this is why we lost. So this, this, like, it's a counterfactual. We think, ah, if this would have been a different line judge who had like, spoken the same, uh, same language. And this, this shows you also, I think, that often these, these counterfactuals become a bit more important if this almost happened. It's only a tiny thing that you have to change, right? There was another famous game where Germany lost 3 to 0, and no one cares about this. Because, I mean, a lot of things would have, been, like, uh, would have needed to be changed in order to get this counterfactual to work. There's something that is also well known, it's called the upward and the downward counterfactual. I think it's also an interesting result. They found that in Olympic Games, for example, uh, people who are on the third prize, who win the, who win the <laughs> bronze medal, or what you call it, they are usually happier than the people on the second prize, who win the silver medal. Because it's the, the like, silver medal winners, they tend to think, ah, if I would have like, done something better, then I would have won. And the third guy, of course, he, he or she thinks, well, I'm lucky that I got a medal. I almost didn't get anything. So this is the upward and the downward counterfactual. And I'm really curious. I mean, there are a couple of arguments, but I'm really curious why they play such a big role in our life. Because from a mathematical point of view, it's, you can say it's a bit of a useless thing. No? You can never actually sort of falsify them. So why do we bother and think about this so much? But this is, uh, <laughs> I mean, this is something you may also want to think about. Uh, at least it's a fun game that uh, I encourage you to play uh, this counterfactual game. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot basically lose, and that's a nice thing. <laughs> okay, any other questions about counterfactuals? Good, so then I would like to summarize this first part. Uh, so what did we do? This was really like language about causality. Uh, most of the things that I said were, was in the setting where we know the causal graph, we know the causal structure, and how can we infer um, infer things about interventions, for example. This is a comment that I would like to do. Uh, it's only true in the first order approximation, but this is really interesting to, uh, to remember, I think. So if you're only interested in IID prediction, so here identically independent and identically distributed data, so if you're only interested in observational questions and observational data, then causality play, doesn't play much of a role. So if you think you have like a you have a causal graph, if you are like Google and you just want to sort of predict whether someone is clicking on your ad or not, and you don't care about changes of the data, or if you just want to predict what sort of uh, what you just said, like in a voice recognition system, so you have your target variable y, and then you have a lot of predictors. So you have a very complicated system, a very complicated causal system, and you're just interested in, in uh, predicting why. Then don't worry too much about causality. It's not so important. I mean, you just want to predict why. So what you do is you include everything that carries information about why, and you don't care whether it's a cause or not. So in this case, you would include all variables that what we call as a, a Markov blanket. So all of these guys carry information, and for some weird reason, so if you include this guy, you also have to include this guy. So you just include these, these variables into your model and predict why. You don't care whether they are causal or not. So if you're only interested in IIT prediction, eh, forget about causality. Causality becomes important whenever you want to change things. 
So when you are asking questions like, well, how can I change, how can I have an influence on why? So if this is the unemployment rate and you want to change it, then the question is, like, what do we do to the system in order to change this? So then you are leaving this setting of IRD prediction, and this is when causality comes into play. So I placed this here on the summary part, but this is, I think, important to remember. Only a true in the first order approximation, because in the third part, we will uh, try to see a couple of scenarios where it still helps. Yeah. So it's still dependent on like full data, right? Yeah, even if you have full data, yeah. It doesn't matter. I mean, it, it requires you to have, I mean, if you only have a subset of, 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 yeah. the, of the data, then you, then, then you may not be able to. So if you do not observe this guy, for example, yeah. so then you will end up concluding this guy. Yeah. But I, I mean, the, the only statement here that I wanted to make here is, that you are sort of, even if you know the causal structure, I mean, what you're doing is, at the end, you're running a, your favorite regression technique, just include everything that you want. You don't care whether this is causal or not. It only matters whether you it makes a big difference if you now want to discuss changes. Because if you consider this variable, this is a very different predictor from this one in a causal sense. Because if I want to change y, I have to like try to change this guy. This guy will not help. Ah, yes, for over, yeah, okay. So this goes into the second order. <laughs> so sometimes the, you're right. So sometimes in knowing the causal structure can help you because of statistical efficiency, for example, yeah. Okay, this is, I mean, I guess I'm repeating or stating the obvious here. If you're interested in inter interventions, then we do have to care uh, about causality. These were the structural causal models that we looked at. They entail graphs, observational distributions, interventions, and as we have seen, counterfactuals. This is something that you do not get out of all causal models, but of some of them. Here I just uh, depicted it uh, again. So it turns out that if you're given, for example, a graph and an observational distribution, then this is enough to sort of recover the interventional distribution. So this is why these two things together are also sometimes called a, a graphical causal model. So if you're giving me a graph and an observational distribution, this is sufficient to compute all the interventions. Whereas if you want to compute the counterfactuals, you ne really need the structural causal models. And as we have discussed briefly, they're a bit funny because the question is, well, where do you get them from, right? Okay, and the last thing, what we did is we also in, in sort of depth discussed this uh, adjusting. And this is really to allow us to compute interventions uh, when there are some hidden variables. Um, good, maybe we do a break a bit earlier, if you don't mind, so a five minutes break. I, I would like to conclude with this study that is I'm very grateful to a friend of mine who studies medical um, uh, medicine at the university who sort of suggested this to me. And um, what they did is this uh, paper from 2011. So uh, they checked, they investigated how fast does the Grim Reaper walk. So the idea was that they had this group of uh, um, elderly people over 70, and they always measured the sort of the speed that they were able to walk. And then they checked whether there's a dependence uh, to the survival probability. And there is a very strong one. So the answer is uh, 0.82 meters per second. So if you are like able to walk faster than this, then your chance of dying, I think, in the next year or so decreases by a factor of 1.5. So this is uh, the answer to the question, how fast does the Grim Reaper walk? And of course, this is one of these uh, observational studies uh, where the answer now is, uh, okay, if you don't want to die, it, uh, the question whether it helps to sort of push the people so that they are faster than 0.82 meters per second is, of course, very questionable. Okay, I would suggest we do, we do an early break and just uh, meet in five minutes again, if that's okay. Before this, any other questions about the first part? I'm not sure whether you are moving fast enough, but uh, hopefully you will be soon. Okay, part two, causal discovery. Again, this picture you have seen before, but again, I would like to stress that there are really two different problems here, right? So in this causal world, we somewhat have the, the causal reasoning. This is what we spend now most of the time on, right? Given the causal model, how can we reason about all this, interventions and, and so on? And the, because the learning discovery is really trying to infer the structure from some observations and uh, interventional data. And now we are sort of 
at least uh, in the first part now, we are assuming that we have an infinite amount of data because even then it's, some, it's something non-trivial. So even then we have to think about how to do it. This is a, in a way the statement maybe a bit more statistically. So uh, we are observing at the end of the day, of course, we are observing finite data from a joint distribution. So you have, let's say, five random variables and you is, yeah, you're receiving a table full of data. So these are your observations. So let's say they are IID. But again, although I'm not covering this here, I'm happy to discuss uh, time series uh, questions later where you have dependencies, time dependencies in the data structure, for example. And then the outcome, what we are trying to estimate is a causal model. For example, a DAG, this is short for directed acyclic graph. So we are trying to infer the causal structure. What I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss a couple of um, assumptions under which this is uh, possible and then uh, we should discuss whether these assumptions make sense or not. Because this is also something that I, I like to stress. In a way, what are we doing in, in statistics is actually very close. So you can show, as I've mentioned this before, you can show that if you, don't, if you want to solve regression and if you don't have a smoothness assumption, so if you cannot assume anything about the underlying smoothness of your function, then in a way you are screwed. You cannot do anything. There's no free lunch, right? This is this famous theorem. So what people have done is they have studied a lot of different smoothness classes of the functions and then at some point uh, you go into the real world and you're trying to fit your model to data and then you have to see whether these assumptions make sense or not. So whether you're able to fit the data or not. And this is, I mean, this deep learning, for example, seems to be, I mean, I'm not an expert there, but it seems to be that there are some underlying assumptions that seem to make sense to some problems. So there seem to be a model class that is suited very well for, let's say, problems in computer vision. In causal discovery, it's not so different. We will see that um, under no assumptions, causal discovery is not possible. So if you don't put any assumptions how these distributions and, for example, the causal structure uh, how they are relating to each other, then you will not be able to find the causal structure. So what we are going to do is we are trying to explore <laughs> very briefly this massive amount, this massive space of assumptions and then see whether this causal discovery becomes possible under certain assumptions. But then, of course, is the question whether these are useful assumptions or not. One side remark there, there is a subtle difference between uh, uh, statistical learning and causal learning, because in statistical learning what you can always do, and this is a very neat thing to do, something like cross-validation. You can always hold out some of the data, then you perform your inference technique, inference machine, and then you see whether sort of the, your model assumptions made sense or not in the sense that you are performing well on this hold out, um, left out data set, right? So let's say you have 10,000 data points, you are leaving out 1,000, you train your model, and then on these left out 1,000 data points, you can see whether you performed well or not. This is more difficult in the causal setting because there we are really after sort of answering interventional questions, right? This is something to keep in mind. So therefore, it becomes even more uh, important to really think about the assumptions, whether you believe in them or not. This is a, a comic that many of you have known, I guess, or already know. So, I used to think correlation implied causation, then I took a statistics class, now I don't. Uh, sounds like the class helped, well, maybe. <laughs> it's the uh, usual uh, joke about a causality and correlation. Of course, it refers to this notion that correlation does not imply causation. Uh, it should be dependence. So there's nothing, I'm not sure whether it's always correlation. Uh, the statement should be dependence does not imply causation, right? So this is what we are all, um, used to, and this is what we have seen in these many examples that I've showed you. I mean, there's a correlation between walking speed and uh, survival probability, but uh, probably it's not causal. But there's a big but to this. So there's something that we call the Reichenbach's common cause principle, and I really ask you to now to be on this whole part, be very critical, and whenever you think that there's an assumption that you don't believe in, shout. Uh, I think that's important. So what does the Reichenbach's common cause principle uh, say? It's says the following. So assume that we have a dependent structure. <laughs> okay, if you're not Philippe <laughs> and you have... <laughs> no, no, this is I'm, it, actually a good point. So when do we ever find dependence? But uh, some things appear to be very dependent, let's put it this way. So here, what is, what is the statement saying? So it says, well, then we may not know whether x causes y or y causes x, but there are a couple of different possibilities and we know that one of them must hold. And the intuition is that if there's a dependent structure, we usually think, well, there must be a reason for this dependent structure. 
Uh, so this is why, if you see this, this graph with the chocolate and no the Nobel Prizes, a lot of people would say, oh, this is a bit funny. And why? Because you see us a dependence, and then we immediately think, well, there must be a reason for this. And it's probably not that the chocolate is causing the Nobel Prizes. It's probably not that the Nobel Prize winners eat more chocolate. But probably it's in the third case here, there's a hidden common cause. Right? So this is the Reichenbach's common cause principle. It says there must be a causal explanation for this. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, um, uh, the, the question is, well, if you observe enough, then some of them will de appear dependent, although they are not. Um, so the uh, quick and dirty answer is, well, then it was probably a mistake from the um, uh, multiple testing uh, correction. So, of course, you see these spurious correlation um, websites where you have the dependencies between um, sort of different, let's say, time series or different uh, variables uh, that seem a bit funny. And they are often, there's the mistake that you just, if you go through enough data, of course, by chance, you will find uh, things that look dependent, although you should correct for it. Uh, this is one uh, quick and dirty answer. There's another one that is a bit more subtle, I think. Um, so th there you could, this is easy to address because you could say, well, this is not really a dependence. Because in the population setting, it would not be dependent if you correct for it properly. There's another thing that is a bit more subtle if you have time series. It seems, I'm not an expert on this, but it seems that most of the things are going up. So if you think about like a lot of, if we are consuming more, we are producing more, you have this tendency that a lot of sort of things seem to be, for example, exponential growth. And if you have something like a very simple law that is beyond sort of many processes. And it seems to be that many of these things go up. This is something that Dominic Jansing looked a lot at. And he would, he would say, for example, that the dependence pattern has to be uh, sufficiently complex. If they're just dependent because both of them go up, then sort of there seems to be a simple rule for explaining this. But this, uh, I mean, this goes beyond this. It's a bit more, a bit more technical, yeah. So if I just look at the random probability distribution over 10,000 10, dimensions, then every two variables are going to be dependent. And how does this fit into philosophically into this framework? I mean, OK, I mean, if you, if you come from a, so this is a very maybe computer scientific point of view, no? So you're just simulating data. Uh, but if you're more like, if you more think about more about re processes in real life, I would say that, well, if you see a dependence, a very strong dependence, and you even do it like you're, you're doing this very properly. So you think that there's a dependence, and then you're investigating this again. You're doing an, another independent story, and you still see that there's a dependence. Somehow you would like to explain it, no? It's, it's this indeed often. I mean, if you, if you see that, I don't know, drinking red wine is, uh, like correlates with your health status or something, that it's not so clear whether it's a causal link. But you still think, well, there must be a reason for this, no? Do you disagree? to find a story. I'm just saying if I pick a random, random this probability distribution, everything is going to be correlated. But I mean, the causation story, I don't know what it means. Right? So. Yeah. One, one last thing that uh, I would like to stress here is that um, there could also, of course, be a combination of those. There's something that is, uh, you may know when you're working with practice that also comes into play that is um, often uh, not listed here, but I think it should be. It means uh, it's something called the selection bias that can also generate a dependence between variables. Uh, and this is a, sort of a funny thing to do. Uh, so this is sometimes called implicit conditioning. So what does it mean? Imagine that this is the true causal structure. So you have a random variable that uh, tells you whether you like uh, Cambridge or not. And you have another variable that tells you whether you like the MIT or not. And then you have uh, variable Z. Uh, that indicates whether you are studying at MIT or not. So now, if you're doing a questionnaire, so you, you, first you may say that, I mean, this uh, true maybe on first order approximation, so uh, whether you like Cambridge or not is maybe independent of whether you like MIT or not. Even if this is the case, if you're now doing, running a survey among people studying at MIT, then you will find a dependence. So the, the mathematical expression is if you are conditioning on this guy, these two uh, will become dependent. And why is this? Imagine you're asking someone 
uh, who's studying at MIT, and you ask her, well, do you like the MIT? And then she says, no, I hate the MIT. It all like all the people, uh, like way too man, much nerdy and whatever. So I hate this building. I, I don't like it at all. Then you actually saying, well, but there must be a reason why you are here, right? There must be a reason, reason that you are studying at MIT, and probably it's because uh, she likes Cambridge a lot. So this is a bit this funny thing that is a bit counterintuitive. So if you select, uh, if you condition on a sort of common child, then these two things become independent. Also, by, it works vice versa, right? So if the person hates Cambridge and doesn't like the weather whatsoever, maybe she really likes the MIT and thinks uh, they're like teaching great stuff here. Okay, so this is uh, something called the Reichmas common cause principle, and of course this is a bit informal here, um, but we can make this uh, a bit more formal with the tools that we have learned so far. So how do you formalize this? Um, in order to do this, hopefully this is the correct time. So I need one technical concept uh, in this session, and this is the uh, notion of deseparation. Who's familiar with deseparation? Okay, so I apologize to those of you. You can go to sleep mode for uh, seven minutes. Uh, so this is what we are going to do. This is, what is it? It's a definition that only concerns graph, graphs, okay? So no uh, probabilities involved. We are only working with these objects, and this will be a property of nodes in this object. We want to say whether two nodes in this graph are deseparated or not. That's what we're going to do. What is a graph? So a graph. Uh, very formally contains like vertices and edges. So you have something that you have seen before. This is a vertex, and you have an edge between those. And we are looking at directed edges, so it's just a subset of the uh, uh, of the product. And here, let's say we do not allow self circles. Okay. So the rest is really in uh, as in real life. So what do I mean? So here, this is just a notion that I may have used before, actually. So here we would say that x4 is a parent of x3. Why? Because uh, just you have an edge pointing from x4 to x3. What is a bit maybe different from real life is that it's also possible to have only one parent or no parent. It's a bit less common in real life. So children, you have the same thing, no? So x5 is a ch child of x4. So because there's a direct connection, descendants and ancestors hopefully are clear as well. So from x1, x4 is an ancestor because you just always go up, right? So here it's a grandfather, father, so you call this an ancestor. Their descendants, the same game. What is a path? Well, a path is just a connection between two nodes, and a directed path is just if you always go the edges in the correct way. This is very natural, no? Uh, what is an immorality? So maybe you can guess this. Uh, so if you have x1, this is a child of two parents, x2 and x3, but they are not married. So they are not uh, connected, so then you call this an immorality. So these are structures that become very important later. So this is also sometimes called a V structure because you have a V here. So whenever you have two nodes pointing to the same node but that are not connected, this is called a V, v structure. <laughs> so then we have a lot of immoralities actually in this graph, that's true. <laughs> yeah, and if you have three parents that are all married, it's also not an immorality anymore. Good, and what we are going to do is deseparation. This is a bit of a technical concept. Uh, what we want to say is when are two nodes deseparated by a third set of nodes? So I tried to do this uh, balance between. Uh, Mathematical correct definition and something that is still possible. These are the statements we are looking for. Xi and Xj are deseparated by a set S. Um, and we are saying that this is the case if all paths between Xi and Xj are blocked by this set S. Well, so far this doesn't help because I'm not uh, telling you what it means to have a path blocked. But I will do in a second. And then how, you, how do you determine whether these two nodes are deseparated given, let's say, this node? Well, you check, you go through all possible paths, and you always check is this path blocked or not. So what do we have to do? We have to understand when is a path blocked. And these are the rules. And these are uh, a bit uh, short, maybe, but hopefully understandable. So we want to check whether these green variables are deseparated by a set that includes green variables. And here are the three rules how to block a path. Rule number one. Whenever you have a path 
where you have sort of two edges in the same direction and the green one in the middle is in the conditioning set, then this path is blocked. So you can think about something flowing and then you just cut it so this, block is, uh, this path is blocked. Are all the other No, they don't have to. This is the problem with not writing down a mathematical definition, but thanks for the question, yeah. They don't have to. It really only matters the uh, uh, neighboring edges to this green one. Second rule, whenever you have two outgoing edges at the green one, then this also blocks the path. Okay, we will see an example in a second. The third one, this is the weird one. And this goes as follows. So whenever you have a path where you have two incoming edges and this node is not in the conditioning set, then this path, path is blocked. And I'm lying a bit here because what it means is that neither this guy is in the conditioning set nor any of its descendants is in the conditioning set. And so the reason is, but this is again only for intuition, if you think about this condition of this example with the studying at MIT, somehow we were conditioning on a common child and the path was not blocked, so we had this dependence. So this is the weird rule. These two hopefully are uh, sort of natural, the third one is the weird, weird one. So let's look at an example. So let's check whether x2 and x5 are deseparated by the green set. So how do we do this? We go through all the possible paths and see whether they are blocked or not. First path is this one. So x2, x1, x5. Uh, this is indeed blocked because of which rule? Number one, right? So you have two edges in the same direction and you block this path. By the way, it also works if you turn them around. Didn't write this down explicitly. There's another path. So let's, let's check this one. Is, is this path blocked or not? It's more tricky. It is blocked because of this guy. So because of rule number two. So a path you only need to block at one point and then it's blocked. So it's like information flowing from red to red. So here, this guy blocks this path because of rule number two. This one is not enough, right? So this one is, here, this bit is not blocked because you have two incoming edges and there's no rule saying, though, if you have incoming edges uh, and a green one in between, there's no rule say, uh, saying that this is blocked. One more example. Uh, so these red guys, given the green ones, are they blocked? So let's say, let's see, are they deseparated given the green ones? So we go through all possible paths. Let's first look at this one. This is the path. Is this blocked? Yes, rule one. It's the same. It's again here. And this is the second path. Is this blocked? Yes, rule three. So this is the weird one. Any questions about this? Yeah. Yeah, so basically, when, when you try to find a set, do you have to kind of uh, uh, like traverse the graph through that uh, allowed direction? Like, for example, when you look at x. Yeah, it doesn't matter. So a path is not directed. So a path is, it doesn't matter which the edges show. It's just one connection looking at the lines, not the direction of the arrows. So this is one path, this is one path, and you cannot, you, may, you cannot travel like one edge twice. I could allow for it, but I think when we did the second one, so the x4 to x1, so we actually have a path from x, x4 to x1, uh, but then... Ah, it's symmetric. It should always give the same result. If it doesn't give the same result, uh, then there is a mistake. <laughs> so it should always give the same result. It's a symmetric definition. Whether x4 and x1 are deseparated, or x1 and x4. It should be symmetric. And indeed it is, no? I mean, because this rule you can invert, and the other ones are symmetric anyhow. Okay, one last thing you do yourself. So x2 and x4, are they deseparated, yes or no? And then we do a quick poll. So think about an answer, yes or no, and then we will do a vote. Five more seconds. I still believe in democracy in this country. <laughs> so let's vote. Who is in favor of, yes, they are deseparated? Who thinks no? And who doesn't care? <laughs> the rest. For a reason, but hopefully we will convince you uh, in a minute that this is important. 
Indeed, they are also deseparated. Why? It's again this rule here, right? So this one is blocked because of this, what we call a collider. And this path is blocked because of what we call a collider here, x5. So now, it's very important. I mean, even if you didn't get the data, I think most of you did. This is a graphical criterion. This only is a statement that you do not know anything about the distribution whatsoever. This is only about graphs. And now comes sort of the relation. Uh, this we don't need, I think. What is a Markov condition? So a Markov condition, what we are now doing, and this is not surprising, because if you want to do causal inference or causal discovery at the end of the day, we somehow have to relate the graph structure with the distribution. And this is done, for example, by this Markov condition. So we say that P is Markov with respect to a graph if the following statement holds. So whenever we have a deseparation in the graph, so whenever two things are deseparated from each other, then they should be independent. So this is now a statement about graphs, and this is a statement about probability distributions. And the question is, <laughs> I ask you to say whenever you disagree with anything, the question is whether we do, do believe in this or not. So here the statement you can think of saying, well, if you have something that is sort of not connected in the graph, then they should be independent. And this hopefully rings a bell, because this is very close to what we have seen uh, is stated as the uh, Reichenbach's common cause principle. In fact, if you like, you can do this as a proposition. So let's say that the distribution is Markov with respect to some causal graph G. Then the <coughs> Reichenbach's common cause principle is satisfied. And the proof is trivial. What does the proof say? Well, the, how does it work? You say, well, dependent variables must be somehow deconnected. OK? And then the question is, well, how can you deconnect variables in a graph? So you have x here, and uh, xj here, and xi here. And now we have to construct a graph that deconnects these, these uh, two things. How does it work? So it must work as follows. So either you have a path that always looks like this. So now always you have these edges. And then this means xi is causing xj. Or maybe you have a graph that points in the other direction. That's also possible. So then you have xj is causing xi. This is also not blocked. Or you have a path that is sort of uh, looks a bit like this. So you have a, a variable here, a w, that is sort of has a directed path to xi and a directed path to xj. So in this case, we would call this a confounder. And what is the third, you know, the fourth, sorry, the fourth possibility? How can we have an open path? If you condition on something, right? So this was the this, this selection criteria. So if you condition on z, so if this is sort of green, about this being green. So if you condition on z, then you can also open a path. And this is what we call the selection bias. So these are the only, I mean, if, if you believe in the Markov condition, then the Reichenbach's common cause principle just follows. And so here I would claim, and of course, I, I mean, I'm happy to be challenged, but I would claim that most people actually agree with this assumption. So I think most people would say that this is a reasonable assumption to make. A much more severe assumption is hidden in the fact that we are looking at uh, acyclic graphs. So this is a bit, more, a bit more tricky. But somehow, I mean, in this Markov condition, so if you're saying that there exists an underlying causal graph that has a causal, an acyclic structure, for example, I would claim most people agree with this definition. Yeah? So can you clarify what you mean by uh, deconnected? Uh, it means not deseparated yeah. by any set S? Yeah, so here, OK, th thanks for this question. So the Markov condition says this holds for all, I'm not I should have written here for all s. So whenever you are deseparated by a set s, then you are conditionally independent given this set s. So what I did here is I was conditioning on the, bit unclear maybe, but I was uh, looking at the following. So xi and xj are deseparated by the empty set. Then this implies xi is independent of xj, right? And then I'm inverting this statement. So when they are dependent, they must be deconnected by the empty set. Thanks for this question. Yeah? I mean, it, it's just, I mean, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to sort of motivate where this assumption comes from, because it looks very technical. But it's really the idea that if you have something that is dependent, you think there must be a causal, 
causal uh, reason for this. And now, so this is uh, something that may, some of you have, may have seen. Um, this is actually the global, the, so this is what we call sometimes the global Markov property. So this is what I just stated. So if you have a deseparation statement, this implies conditional independence. You may think, well, I've seen a Markov property before. This looks, the, the list looks different. Turns out this is equivalent. So this is equivalent, for example, to the local Markov property, which says that each variable is independent of its non-descendants given its parents. Um, so whenever you condition on the parents, you're sort of uh, independent of your non-descendants. And there's another one called the Markov factorization property. Uh, this means when you have a, so the distribution is Markov with respect to a certain graph, whenever you can factorize the joint density. So if this is your joint density over your D variables, then this factorizes according to um, what we call a Markov kernel. So it's always, these factors are always a variable given its parents. This you may have seen before in undirected graphs, I'm not sure. So here, but you don't need positivity of, positivity of the density, just the existence of a density. Not super important, just means this is all the same thing. The Markov condition, I would think about it in this way. So if something is deseparated in the graph, it should be independent in the distribution. So now, you want to invent a causal inference technique, a causal discovery method. How do you do it? You start with the Markov condition. This is already nice because it relates sort of, uh, it relates somewhat the deseparation in the graph that you don't know with the conditional statement in the distribution. How do you continue? What do you do? Yeah, so let's say I'm giving you even an infinite amount of data. So you have the full distribution. Yes, very good. So the first idea is to say, well, if you have this connection, then we are trying to exploit this. So we first sort of check all the conditional dependencies that we have, and then we relate this back to properties in the graph. It's a bit unfortunate, though, that this only holds in one direction, right? So it means whenever we have a deseparation here, that we have an independence here. Um, the problem is, imagine. I give you like some distribution and I give you some ind condition independencies that hold in this distribution. Problem is you can always find a lot of graphs that satisfy this Markov property by just making it fully connected. Because if you have a fully connected graph, then there's, nothing, there's no deseparation. So this statement certainly is satisfied because you don't have any deseparation whatsoever. So yeah, sort of it's a good idea, but so you are slightly stuck because if you would do this, you have too many, too many graphs. So what do you do? This was the Markov condition. So deseparation implies condition independence. So what do we do? We just assume that the other direction holds as well. And this has a famous name that uh, you already guessed, I think. This is called the faithfulness assumption. So what we're assuming is we're saying P is faithful with respect to a graph if the other direction also holds. So, so if whenever we have a condition independence statement, we have a deseparation. So why is this a nice definition to have? Uh, why, why is this a nice assumption? Because now we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between properties in the graph, these guys, and properties in the distributions, these condition independencies. And now we can start doing causal discovery. I wrote down a couple of examples that I would like you to think about. Is this clear? Or is this is there a question? So now all of you can start doing causal discovery. So let's do an example. So we assume that P, a distribution, we're given a distribution, is Markov and faithful with respect to a causal graph G. Okay? And now I'm giving you a list of condition independencies, and you're trying to find me the graph. Number one, say x is independent of z. Ah, so the, the, following, the following list is always complete. Okay, I'm now giving you all the condition independencies that hold in this distribution. The following list, lists are complete. Okay, first example, you have x independent of z, and you have variables 
what are the variables involved? X, Y, and Z. Okay, try to find the graph. Second example. X is independent of Y given Z. We have the same variables X, Y, and Z. The third example is actually likely that I did a mistake here because it was uh, too late in my home zone time. Uh, so x independent of y, but you'll figure this out. x independent of w given z. It's a long list now. y independent of w given z. x independent of w given z and y. The last one, y independent of w given z and x. Okay. So these are, the, these are three different examples, and I would like you to take a piece of paper and think about whether you can recover the causal graph or the causal graphs that lead to exactly these conditional dependencies. And how would you do it? I mean, again, because of the Markov assumption and the faithfulness, we know that this is now in one-to-one -one correspondence to the conditional dependencies in the graph, right? So uh, to the D separations in the graph, sorry. So now what you're doing is you're looking for graphs that encode exactly these uh, sets of D separations. And please start now. Here you may have guessed it, but here you have variables x, y, w, and z. Okay, are you done? Or do you, does anyone need one more minute? We can solve it, maybe not. So first one. Any suggestions? Are we supposed to find only one graph? Ah, that's a good question. So find all the graphs that are possible. Sometimes there's only one graph possible, and sometimes there are more possible. Yeah. So in the first one, <laughs> um, I didn't understand the word, but I think it was correct. <laughs> you look very confident. <laughs> You have x and z, and they're both pointing into y, right? So here you find that x and z are independent, so they are deconnect, uh, they are deseparated by the empty set, right? This is correct because you have this weird rule with the input in pointing arrows, but it causally it also makes sense, right? There's no causal sort of path between x and z, so they are independent. But this is the only thing that is independent uh, because, for example, if you condition on y, then you open this path. So then. Possibility here? Uh, yeah, this is why I, I mean, I, this is why I said the following lists are complete. So if it would be the disconnected graph, you would have more independencies, right? So you would also have that x is independent of y and y is independent of z, and they're jointly independent and so on. This is why I said the following lists are sort of complete. This is by what I meant by this. But is this example clear? It's a bit funny, no? So you have three random variables. And you immediately got the correct uh, graph out of it. So there's only one graph, and uh, this is the only graph encoding these separations. And this, this is the special rule of what we call an immorality or a v-structure or whatever. You will see this in a second. Uh, the second one, any suggestions? I think so, yeah. yeah. X goes to Z goes to Y. goes to y, this is one, or, so now here it's, we are less lucky, so now there are a couple of uh, graphs possible, or the other direction, right? Anything else? Yeah. So here we actually have three graphs that are possible. All of them encode exactly this set of uh, D separations or condition independencies. Anyone got the third one? I think x goes to z and y goes to z and x goes to w. And, yeah, x goes to z and y goes to z and? z goes to w. Yeah. to z. Yeah. That's the only one. Is this clear to everybody? Because otherwise, please ask. So this is, uh, this is important now for the next slides. OK, so there's something. I mean, this very naturally leads to a definition. What's the complexity 
Ah, very good question. Well, I, you know, at point three, I don't want to do it already. When does, uh, <laughs> when does a computer uh, doesn't want to do it? <laughs> very good question. I come back to this if I may. The first thing is, um, there's a very natural co definition now. So you see that in this case, for example, you cannot distinguish between these graphs, right? And um, the reason is that they are called what we would call Markov equivalent. So the point is they encode exactly the same uh, set of D separations. And whenever this happens, you call graphs a Markov equivalent. So there's a definition. Um, GH encoding the same set of D separations, then you call them Markov equivalents. And also, the set of all graphs that encode the same set of these separations are called a Markov equivalence class. So they are members of the same Markov equivalence class. OK, this is just names. Um, what you can now already guess is that whenever you are using an inference technique that is based on these conditional independencies, and this is sort of the first major idea that we are looking at here, you will never be able to distinguish between Markov equivalent graphs because they encode the, exactly the same set of D separations, but this is all what you have. If you're starting from your distribution and you have conditional independencies, you don't have anything else than this, so you cannot distinguish between graphs within the same Markov equivalence class. So now, what is the obvious research question here? How do you characterize these guys? Here we decided to go for those Markov uh, properties, and we said, well, if I look at those things, I'm going to have those properties. I'm going to make this leap of faith and assume that it has faithfulness and that it comes the other way. But isn't that telling me that this is not the right notion to understand causality? Right? I really, in the end, I really want to understand what direction those arrows are. So yeah. why don't I just put a stronger definition that, say, at least you know, tells me it's either x to z y or y to z to x, but removes the possibility of the third one? This is right. an excellent question. So the regularly faithful condition just puts extra conditions, so I don't see that. I don't want to see it. This is an excellent question. Um, unfortunately, you are like uh, 15 minutes ahead, <laughs> maybe even one day. So we will do exactly this tomorrow. So um, we will see one of these assumptions that makes this possible, and I'm not claiming it's the only one. But we are looking at we will look at one assumption that goes beyond this mark of. Uh, um, a mark of condition and faithfulness that is slightly different. So if you think about this huge space of assumptions, we have the mark of and faithfulness somewhere, and we want to exploit also a different kind set of assumptions that, for example, will uh, enable us to distinguish between these graphs. And of course, there will be strong assumptions, but we, are, we will discuss them. But it's a very good point. And I think, so this is maybe now a bit philosophical, but I think where this comes from is also, if you think about causality, as being sort of a, a graphical thing. So if you start from causal graphical models, so you, you really start with a causal graph and a distribution and say, this is my model, then it's very natural to first come up with graphical assumptions, no? And so you, what else is there? I mean, you're thinking about a graph and a distribution, and what else is there to say, well, then I'm just saying, like, somehow connect properties in the graph and in the distribution. But we will see, of course, there, there are more ways, and especially if you think about structural causal models, there are many other ways of imposing assumptions. But this is, I mean, it's a guess, but this is, I think, why, where this comes from. Because it, 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 for many years, it was a very graphical uh, sort of point of view on this causality. But, the, but I mean, it's a, you remove a lot of what you can actually infer from, from conditional independence when you just say it's either conditionally independent or not. Yes, right? and I mean, this will be a If I say my graph only takes values 0 and 1 on the edges, then when I observe a set of values for conditional independence for conditional dependence measures, then I can probably just would it be would it be okay to postpone this to ten minutes? Okay. Great, thanks. This would be great. Because it's exactly the right question and we we should discuss this. Um, but first I would like to say to a bit more how you do this in practice, if that's okay. But it's it's a good question. So we have this Markov equivalence class, and it's a bit unsatisfactory. You're right that in some settings, we cannot even infer whether x is causing y or y is causing x. But on the positive side, in some settings, we can, right? So this was a bit of a special thing. This is also a bit of a special thing. But there we can get like one causal graph that says, OK, there's even like uh, we know like x is causing y and z is causing y, and, uh, and there's no causal direction 
uh, between x and z and so on. Yeah? If you have a reversible Markov chain, you cannot distinguish the direction, right? x, y. Yeah, so th and this is a bit, this is bad, right? So uh, this is what we want, want to improve, and this is what we are going to do uh, tomorrow. To do with the, I mean, this reversible Markov chain just, it's, uh, it's, it has nothing to do with the way you decided to look at dependencies. It's, the distribution is the same, right? You can. Ah, this we will, this we will discuss tomorrow. Okay. So there is a way to make it distinguishable if you impose other kinds of assumptions that we will look at tomorrow. Yeah. But now, so the first thing is to say, well, what can we actually identify? So the research question here is, or like this, the first question that you have in mind is, well, can we actually characterize which of these graphs are Markov equivalent? Because if we can, then we, we can say, aha, these are exactly the, ca the causal graphs that we cannot distinguish, okay? And this is something that has been answered um, by Verma and Pearl. This is a famous lemma. Um, and it basically says the following. So two graphs are Markov equivalent if and only if the following holds. So G and H are Markov equivalent if and only if. And now comes the magical description. So if and only if they have the same skeleton and the same set of V structures. So they have the same skeleton. And same V structures, realities. Okay, so why is this a very useful description? It's on the graph base, right? So now we can actually say, we can have a look at this graph, for example, and see whether there's any other. Ah, sorry, sorry for that. What is a skeleton? A skeleton is if you just remove the arrowheads. So if you just look at the sort of the connections here. So if you say the undirected graph, x connecting y <coughs> connecting z, this is the skeleton. So you just get rid of the arrowheads. So now what this says is that two graphs are Markov equivalent whenever they have the same skeleton and the same set of V structures. And this is what you can see here. So let's first look at this example maybe. So all of these graphs have the same skeleton, right? They all have the same structure, x, z, y, x, z, y, x, z, y. And they all have the same set of V structures, namely nothing. So there's no V structure here. So they are all Markov equivalent. That's good. That corresponds to the theory. So then we should not be able to distinguish them. This one here is sort of a bit of a special thing because this is the only graph in its Markov equivalence class. Why is this? Well, now we have to build sort of graphs with the same skeleton, but we also have to sort of make sure that it has the same v-structure here. Well, there's only one way, right? There's one v-structure that you have to, there's no other graph in this Markov equivalence class. Is this clear? The last one is a bit funny, no? So here, again, it's only one graph in the Markov equivalence class. And why is this? So again, we, we must have the same skeleton. And we have one v-structure here. So x and y are both pointing to z. So this v-structure is fixed. So this we have to keep. So when you're looking for other members in the Markov equivalence class, you have to keep this v-structure. The question is, what about this edge? You would think, well, there's no v-structure, right? So you could uh, invert it. But you cannot, because this would generate new v-structures. And this is, a bit, this is a bit a tricky thing, because sometimes, um, let me see whether I can make an example right now. So if you would have a graph that has this additional edge, this would still be only the, the, the only graph in its Markov equivalence class. Because, again, you may must have the same skeleton. This, this, uh, these edges are fixed because of the v-structure. This one is fixed because it would create a new v-structure. But now, finally, this is also fixed because it would create a cycle. So you have some sort of non-trivial cases where the Markov equivalence class is surprisingly small. Is this clear? So this means that with this idea, it's sort of, we, we know our limit, our theoretical limit. So if anything, we can recover the Markov equivalence class of the graphs, but not more. There's one example that is especially unfortunate. So imagine you have only two variables. So what happens then? Remind me one thing that's local. Do I look only at the three uh, graphs, or yep. is it also it's the local. Dependence? No, it's local. So you only look at whether there's a direct connection but yeah, <laughs> immorality, actually, now I agree, is a very weird name because, <laughs> okay, anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you really look only whether there's a direct link between the parents. Good, but what about the bivariate case? This is especially unfortunate 
So if you have x causing y, there's something else in the Markov equivalence class, namely y causing x. So this is especially unfortunate because now in the bivariate case we cannot do anything. So and this is what I meant earlier by saying, well, it sometimes it sometimes helps to have more than uh, two variables in the in the system because here by definition you won't find any v structures, right? In the graph where you uh, put a connection between y and w, why is it the only uh, one? Uh, okay, so first we have to fit, it has to be the same skeleton, right? So the skeleton is the same. So now the question is, can we invert some of the arrows? This one you cannot invert because you have a V structure here. X and V are both, po both pointing to Z. So you cannot invert one of these edges. This one you cannot invert the, from Z to W because if you would invert it, you would get a new V structure. That's also not allowed. And so this is why I drew it, because it's a bit funny. This one is the last one you could invert, but you cannot because this would generate a cycle. And we are only looking at acyclic graphs in this framework. Doesn't that also change the V structure, though, through the W, if you invert it? Yeah, but this is not a V structure, yes. because they, these guys are married. So a V structure means oh. that they, these, okay. these people are not married here. So there's no direct link. So th therefore, this is not a V structure. Because it's connected. Yeah? I guess I'm trying to understand the, some of the assumptions a little more. So, can you give an example of something you just not faithful? Aha, can you? So, the question is can we give an example to a graph that is not faithful? So, what do we need? We need a graph in which we find, in which we have something that is not deseparated but is still independent. Any ideas? Except for you. We have seen such a graph before. And there one of you claimed, ah, this is a very unlikely graph. What was it? For example, if two paths cancel, cancel each other out. So this you can do, right? So let's look at this. In this case, what you would find is um, so G, if this is G, P is not respect to G because here we have an independence that we don't expect from the structure. So here we have X is independent of Y. Is this clear, by the way, or shall I, shall I write this down? Why is this the case? Do you see that? It's just plugging in. So if you maybe I write it down once. So if you have this structural equation here, so you have y equals two times x minus z plus some noise. And now we plug in the value for z. So we get two x minus two x minus n z plus n y. And this equals just so you these two things cancel, so you get minus nz plus ny. And this is independent of x. There's no x involved here. All the noise variables are independent. So this is, for example, a case where you, you would have a, a violation of faithfulness. Um, is this a bad thing? So you could argue, well, this is very unlikely, right? And we have seen this before. Um, maybe I comment on this now. So it's a bit of a tricky thing because of the following reasons. So one, I said that sometimes nature wants us to be non-faithful. So this is what we sometimes find, especially in biological systems, I, I would assume. There's another argument. This, I mean, Caroline Ula is also working here, right? So she, she analyzed uh, the following question. So now I, I know that I, I said a lot that I will focus on the full distribution rather than on the finite sample. But in a way, one has to be careful, because this is, in a way, drawing the world in a too nice picture. Imagine now you have data, and you want to test these things. And I can tell you, as I mean, we have been working a bit on condition independence as well, condition independence testing. It's a super difficult thing. It's a very hard statistical problem, at least for us. So now, it turns out that if you want to test these things, then you really need either a lot of data or 
like putting it the other way around to say if you want to have guarantees like under a finite sample amount of data, what you need is something that we call a strong faithfulness. So you need that you are not even close to an independence. So here we, you would say, well, it's very unlikely to have two parts canceling each other out exactly. The problem is if you think about finite data, then you also don't want to have this, where you have two parts that are canceling each other out like roughly. Because in order to, to detect this dependence, you need a lot of data. And what Caroline, for example, did is she analyzed, well, how strong is the assumption of strong faithfulness? And this is something, I mean, I did even during, when I started my PhD, I, was, I also thought about this question when I just ran simulations, right? This is the easy way of doing it. So you just simulate graphs, let's say with five variables, and then you just see how often do I find a violation of faithfulness in the sense that I find a dependence, but maybe it's not even there. So I know it's, it shouldn't be there because it's there with probability zero, but the data suggests that this independence is there. And you find it all the time. So this is, I mean, I don't have the, the graph here. I, if I show you, I mean, this is like you go to a million data points and you always find these violations of faithfulness. And this is why this is really a tricky, tricky assumption to work on. I mean, you can even do this more analytically, more mathematically, as I said, has been done. But even if you d do it empirically, you see that because there are so many different tests that you need to do if you have like seven variables, then you always find these non-faithfulness things. And I mean, people have been using these techniques for graphs with thousands of variables. So there, it's really a question of uh, what this assumption is. OK, but yeah? yeah so the example that you gave is primarily for a linear model, right? So like basically, the, the, the faithfulness yeah. in for, for a general graph, where there is no. Yeah, but in, if you have non-linearities, you can also have cancellations, for example. It's a bit more tricky. It's more, much, this hasn't been analyzed, I think. But we will see that the nonlinearity actually helps us in some other ways as well. <laughs> yeah. OK, so it, just to sort of tell you the rest of this first idea, so this is what we call an independence-based method, or sometimes called constraint-based me method. It's really this, this idea. So you have a joint distribution. You look at the all independencies and condition independencies. You create a list. And then you, by the faithfulness assumption and the Markov assumption, you find the graph that is corresponding to the set of D separations. And as we have seen before, so this is, uh, sorry, this is a, an idea. And I, I, I mean, it was one of the first ideas in this area, right? So this is quite creative, I think. So Pearl calls this inductive causation. Um, Peter Spertus and Clark Limmer uh, call this the PC algorithm. Uh, or FCI is a version that covers uh, hidden variables uh, as well. This stands for fast causal inference. It turned out it was not so fast. So there's another method that is called RFCI, called really fast causal inference, <laughs> trying to do the same thing. And then now there's FCI plus, which I think is even complete. OK, but this is the idea. So you find all conditional dependencies from the data, and you select the DAGs that correspond to these independencies. And so this is what we have seen, right? It's not as easy because the problem is uh, there might be more graphs than this one, right? And now we know. What are these graphs? These are all the graphs that are in the, Markov, the same Markov equivalence class, right? So even with an infinite amount of data, this is what we can suggest from this method. So we can hope that it um, sort of points us to the correct Markov equivalence class, but not much more. Um, yeah, one, uh, one example here. So this is what we have seen before. So the nightlight uh, and the child myopia so it's not, I mean, there are a couple of problems with this method that we have already seen. But it's not, I mean, in some situations, it's quite neat, I think. So you can make use of this. So if you have this notion, and if, especially if you have a lot of knowledge in the graph, and you're only looking for some edges, for example, I think this helps. So here in this example, it would help, I think. So we found that the nightlight, whether you put a nightlight in your room or not, this is depending on child myopia, right? Whether your child develops myopia. It now turned out, this was a second study in Nature one year later that this dependence vanishes if you check whether the parents have myopia or not. So it turned out that if the parents had myopia, they somehow were more likely to put a nightlight uh, in the ch child's bedroom because they thought they're probably afraid in the dark. But this was not so much because of the kid, but apparently because the parents, was, uh, the parents were afraid in the dark. So this is why you have this dependence. And then, of course, uh, because it's your child, they're more likely to develop um, myopia. So this is an independence that they found um, in this another study in the next study, 2000, and they didn't find any other independencies. And therefore, 
you can infer that this must be the correct graph, right? Because what you find is that, I mean, the, <laughs> you, you have some background knowledge. We are now combining. So this is not enough. This is exactly the situation, right? So usually we would say there are three possible graphs in our, in our sort of uh, uh, possible range of causal graphs. But here, of course, <laughs> we have some background knowledge. It's pretty unlikely that the children's myopia influences the parents' myopia. And it's also pretty unlikely that the nightlight has an influence on the parents' myopia because the parents are not sleeping in this room, right? So you have some background knowledge, and then you can rule out two of these uh, cases, and the only thing that you're left with is this causal explanation. And of course, it's a, it's a sort of a toy example, um, but it shows you that in some situations where you have a lot of background knowledge as, as well already, then these independencies, they can help you to identify uh, sort of the causal graph. So there's some work on... Uh, on brain-computer interfaces, for example, uh, where people have done this. So they have a lot of knowledge, they're just interested in a single part, and then they look at these condition independence tests. Uh, yes, because both of them found the same thing. So this is, I looked at this at some point. So they, they, this was the first one. This was the one where I cited where they didn't use the C word, but they said it's a precipitating factor or something. And then I think they're both found the same thing in a, in a follow-up study, and they agreed to publish both at the same time, if I remember correctly. I think the title then, somehow they probably agreed on this. And see, if you find a dependence, you're looking for a causal structure. So they must be, <laughs> anyhow. <laughs> okay, so this is again the method. In practice, and this now relates to your question from earlier, you have to be much, much smarter than this because otherwise this would explode, right? So in a way, if you like list all the variables, you can imagine that you end up with like five variables, but certainly not with hundreds or so. Um, and this is what the PC algorithm really does. So it's, if you look at it, I'm not writing it down. Um, there are many packages that you can um, do it, like download online. It combines these condition dependencies in a very clever and automatic way. So it's a very neat algorithm. So it's super efficient. It runs very quickly. So if you Tell it the list, it, so sort of usually it's done in an oracle type setting, so where you're saying um, the PC algorithm asks for a condition independence, and then you have to provide an answer yes or no, and then it sort of infers. And it's a greedy algorithm, it has some drawbacks, but it's, in its idea, it's very clever, and it's correct in the oracle version. So if the independence oracle always gives the same, the correct answer, yes or no, so we assume that these problems with near faithfulness do not happen, then it's correct and it's very fast. Um, in terms of complexity, it now depends on the, uh, you can actually show that this is, um, I think, an NP-hard problem, uh, maybe NP-complete, I'm not sure at the moment, I should know. Um, but you can show that in general there cannot be an, uh, a very fast version of this, but uh, you can actually, if you, for example, bound the number of parents, so if you know that the possible number of parents is bounded by, let's say, five. So you never have more than five variables, then it's a polynomial algorithm. Yeah. Okay, but so as I said, there are, there are sort of many, uh, many problems with this. So one we already discussed with the faithfulness. Another one that I would like to point out, I mean, really try this at some point, like looking for condition independencies. This is a very hard problem. What people do in practice a lot is they look at partial correlation. So, it's a bit of a funny thing. They say, at the beginning, we don't want to assume anything about the, the distribution here. Uh, we want to be very non-parametric. But then in order to test these condition dependencies, then um, sometimes you are like falling back to these partial correlations. Just maybe one hint why this is, is a diff very different, difficult problem. So imagine, imagine that you have a, a graph that looks like this. two random variables, x and y, and they are indeed separated, but they are only separated if you condition on 20 other random variables. So you, there's no link. They can be deseparated, but you have to condition on all of those. In a way, this is a very hand-wavy argument now, but in a way, if you want to find this, so if you want to see, so if you write down the structural equation for x, it looks like this, right? So it's a function of z1 to z20 plus some noise, and the function for y is, let's say, g, 
So z1 to z20 plus some noise ny. If you want to really find that these two are conditionally independent given the z's, which is true, right? Then what you have to be able to do is you have to at least be able to solve this non-parametric regression problem, right? So otherwise, there's no chance. You somehow need, what you need to do is you have to correct for the dependence from the z's on y and x, right? This means that at least you have to be able to solve this regression problem. And in a way, this is even an easy situation because no one tells you that this noise acts in an additive way, right? So this is a very hand wavy argument that maybe tells you why these condition independencies are so difficult if you want to do this in a non-parametric way. Right, because you're conditioning, this means, well, it's certainly you have to be on, like, uh, you need to solve these non-parametric regression problems as well, and this is certainly not super easy if you have 20 predictors, right? Or imagine you have 50. So this is a hint maybe that, I mean, indeed, it's a nice idea, it's a first idea for causal discovery, but one has to be a bit careful about the condition dependencies there. Questions? Yeah. <laughs> Start with a generative model for causal graphs and so Yeah, so is the suggestion to start with a generative model? Yeah. Um, yeah, so let's say that I have like prior and then causal graphs and then it would apply certain reasons to independency. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, um, two answers to this. So uh, the first thing, if you have a bit of a background knowledge and you expect some graphs more than others. This is certainly fine. You can include this. Um, you can include background knowledge if you know that there are a couple of edges that exist. There are also Bayesian methods, Bayesian versions of this. There are many different implementations now that I don't talk about that are pretty clever that can make this scalable to like hundreds and hundreds of nodes. Uh, very easy even like if you don't uh, bound the number of parents and so on. There, there's a, it's a huge field. The, regarding the generative model, this is uh, we will look at uh, tomorrow at an example where we sort of take a slightly different approach where we are saying, well, maybe if you start from these structural causal uh, structural assignments and not so much with these graphs and these separations, but if you start with these assignments and make assumptions, for example, the additive noise we will investigate uh, tomorrow, then uh, this also helps for causal discovery. But of course, one, I mean, one can do this, but then you're plugging in a lot of assumptions, right? Yeah. Intuitively, what does imposing faithfulness and condition? I'm sorry. Intuitively, what does yeah, so imposing faithfulness? So, okay, so, so let's say that we have all the dependencies, and then but to find the find the causal graphs, we need to assume faithfulness and, and, and the model. In this method, in you this do method. have to assume, yeah. Intuitively, what what does it imply? How are we really restricting mm -hmm. graphs? Like, I'm. Yeah. I, if, if you didn't do that, if you didn't like impose like faithfulness. Yeah. Okay. This is a, if you don't assume uh, faithfulness, then you cannot. Then maybe you can answer this question. I mean, if I'm saying well, I'm not imposing faithfulness, then I have the following problem. If I'm only imposing uh, the Markov condition, then what I can do is I just provide a fully connected graph. If I'm providing a fully connected graph, this can be any direction. So it doesn't matter. So then, how many deseparations do you think do we have in this graph? None, right? So there's no deseparation, so certainly the Markov assumption is satisfied. Certainly we have, whenever we have a deseparation, something else holds. It doesn't matter what holds. I mean, you can say, I get a car or something. It doesn't matter. There's no deseparation here. So this implies then certainly the Markov condition is satisfied. And this is why you, you do not go every, anywhere without the faithfulness assumption. So it's really important to say that you don't expect any other independencies to occur. Faithfulness as a very strong prior on the possible graphs. Um, so can you think about faithfulness as a prior on the graphs? I would rather say you can think about it as a prior on the uh, edge weights, for example, on the functions. And it's a bit of a weird prior. And this is why, uh, sort of, if you want to say you're bounded away from faithfulness, this is, for example, why the analysis becomes a bit more complicated. But I would rather think about it this way. But uh, again, I mean, I'm open, open for suggestions. Okay, I think I'm running over, over time, so this is the next uh, visual break. It's a very nice sauna close to Denmark, so I'm making a bit of advertisement. So whenever you want to visit Copenhagen, you can actually, there's a sauna and you can swim in the Öresund. Okay, with this, uh, thanks a lot and see you tomorrow.